everyone, this is Professor Gravit, and this is the lecture video for the final part of the novel Cracking India. So, welcome! Okay, so this is the agenda for this video. First, I'm going to talk about important elements of the last third of the text, um, and, you know, some, some things that happen that I think are important, um, just some uh, big takeaways. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the approaches to literary criticism we have investigated so far. So we're going to talk a little bit, or I guess I'll remind you a little bit of uh, formalism, historicism, and then also uh, talk a little bit about feminist criticism, which we discussed a little bit last week, but I'm going to give you um, a bit more about that this week. Then finally, we will talk about this discussion post, and I'll give you some reminders at the end of the video. So, some important elements of Cracking India. Right at the end of the second part that I assigned you, Aya had been kidnapped um, by Ice Candy Man and some of his men. Uh, what happened to her during that time is left unsaid, <laughs> um, but, but it's implied that she was um, violated in many ways, um, which is awful. And Linny is devastated. She is the one who sort of gives her away and feels awful about it because she sort of didn't really understand what was happening. She thought she could trust this guy. Um, and, you know, she's sort of going through the, the repercussions of that and, and how things have changed. Um, another important thing that happened was Imam Din's village had been destroyed along with most of its inhabitants. So um, when Lenny had visited their village before, uh, she had met a lot of a lot of people and friends and a lot of folks from different religions. And um, Imam Din is a is a Sikh, and uh, their village was raided uh, to sort of tell them to leave, right, because of the the partition and only you know one young boy survived to to tell this really horrible story um and then the camp for fallen women appears next door to lenny's house um and this sort of helps the truth come out about what lenny's mom and aunt were doing and kind of and connects with the previous two points as well um there's this concept of of the fallen woman that is brought up in the novel and uh it's it's been a concept in in literature and also in sort of society for a very long time but it kind of hit its height during victorian during the victorian age in the 1800s um in the 19th century and there was this concept that if a woman was sullied in any way that she could no longer or should no longer participate in quote unquote polite society. So the picture I have here is a painting um, from the Victorian era of a woman sort of being shoved out of her house because she's had a baby out of wedlock, right? So um, this sort of depicts the a lot of the stigma and the shame around um, women who either you know, had relationships outside of marriage or were forced to have relationships outside of marriage, uh, especially in the case of Cracking India. Um, the fallen women at the camp next door are those like the, like Aya that have been kidnapped or the women in a mom Din's village um, that, you know, were used to sort of horribly make a point, right? And, and Lenny's mother and aunt were actually sort of helping these women get back to... Um, their homes. They were uh, providing a service of of taking them and sort of getting them out of the country, right? Shuttling them around. That's why they had all the gas in the back of the of the car that she that Lenny thought was sort of used to make the the city burn. But actually, they were really trying to sort of help help these women, right? Um, and finally, Godmother finds Aya and tries to help her leave and does. They do end up successfully helping her leave. But there's this really tragic scene where Lenny and her Godmother go to where Aya is being kept. Um, she was forced to marry Ice Candy Man. 
and now she sort of performs as a dancer in what we would sort of call like a red light district, (laughs) um, where there's a lot of prostitution, a lot of, um, you know, bars and things like that, right? Drug, drug dealing, all that stuff. Um, so it's a really upsetting situation, um, but they do finally get her, get her out, right? And that's how it ends. So I guess the main point here is that a lot of the, a lot of the story revolves around Aya and how, and, and her story and how it plays out, how her identity, both in terms of religion and her gender, put her at the crux of this political upheaval and, and made her very vulnerable and um, a target for violence, right? And how the the women in the story really are the ones who bear the, bear the brunt of the violence of the partition that was forced on these people. So I think that's a, a big point here and also why we are discussing feminist criticism with this novel in particular. So to, to do a quick review of some other approaches that we've been thinking about, um, one is formalism. So, for example, we've been looking at the narratorial perspective, right? So how per, both Persepolis and Cracking India are written from the perspective of a, ch- of a child, right? That is a, that is a choice of how the novel is written, not necessarily what it is written about. Yeah. So another example is analyzing Persepolis through the form of the graphic novel. So how the novel is written Um, and other formal elements like foreshadowing, the tone of the text, any imagery, um, illusion, irony. Right. All of the sort of those literary words that you probably heard a lot of in high school. (laughs) um, That's that's formalism. That's looking at a text through its formal elements. Again, sort of how it is written, the way it is written, not necessarily what it is written about, or the sort of context surrounding the novel. So a lot of high school English classes will be almost um, specifically (laughs) on formalism, um, or they were when I was in high school. Maybe things have changed, but yeah, so that's sort of thinking about the form of the piece. Another approach that we have been talking about extensively is historicism. So this is basically understanding the social and historical context that surround an author and the times and places in which their works are set. Um, So the two examples here are relating Persepolis to the Iranian Revolution and the Iran and Iraq War. So how that shapes that text and how, um, you know, it's really the sort of backbone of why it was produced in the first place. And the same thing with Cracking India through looking at that through the lens of the partition and how the historical, you know, circumstance um, shaped both the content of the novel and how it was written. Yeah. So like how we can learn more about the author and again, the text itself by looking at the context surrounding it. And then finally, this one we talked a little bit about last week, but Um, Another approach that is often taken, especially to works by women writers, is feminist criticism. And basically, feminist criticism examines the gendered relationships of the characters in a text, right? Um, Examples would be how, you know, how how are the characters stereotypical in a gendered way, right? Or how are they not? Do they have stereotypical gendered characteristics, right? Is are the people who are women, do they display sort of um, feminine characteristics and the same goes with men, right? So some common concerns of feminist critics, like sort of more traditional ones, are describing relationships between the literary text and ideas about power and sexuality and gender. So looking at power relationships, um, deconstructing the way that women characters are described in novels, stories, plays, etc., especially if the author is male. So looking at um, the way that male authors um, portray female characters, examining how relationships between men and women and those assuming male and female roles are depicted in the text, again, including power relations, right? So, so looking at these characters and sort of thinking about them through the lens of gender, um, this has expanded quite a bit, and it, and it does not just <laughs> just uh, encompass male and female anymore, right? We, we can think about gender and it's all, on all of its multi- multiplicities. So this was just sort of the, the foundations of what cr- feminist criticism looked like, but it has expanded quite a bit. And one way that it has expanded is thinking about 
uh, global feminism or feminisms in different geographical locations. So this is from the excerpt that I had you read today on transnational third world and global feminism. So I'm just going to read this and then we'll talk about it. (laughs) So transnational third world and global feminisms are predicated on the premise that women's oppression diverges globally due not only to gender, but also race, class, ethnicity, religion, and nation. Um, The three types of feminisms here are not interchangeable necessarily um, as they differ in their origins and outlooks and uh, goals and priorities. So the most common insight, though, on which these feminisms are based, however, is that third world women suffer from multiple forms of oppression qualitatively distinct from the gender oppression experienced by middle class white women in the West, uh, resulting from intersections of various disadvantaging factors, again, such as race, ethnicity, ethnicity, class, religion, and nation. So a lot of uh, global feminisms are looking at this concept of intersectionality. Yeah, looking at how race affects gender, look at how looking at how class, religion, nation, etc., um, impacts uh, women's oppression, right? And we can definitely see that in cracking India. So I've got one more quote for you to read, and then again we'll talk about it some more. So before the advent of these three feminisms, disenfranchised third world women had been considered helpless victims. Um, whose voices were unreliable. It, this is from the, the sort of standpoint of Western feminists, so Western white feminists. Yet in line with the feminist standpoint theory, transnational third world and global feminists consider uh, third world women's marginalized and social locations as especially prop- propitious for producing less partial and distorted understanding of the human condition. So what that means is that their voices are... <laughs> Um, actually quite useful in these conversations because they're sort of looking at um, the world from their own perspective that, say, a white woman in America couldn't necessarily understand. So it continues by saying their marginalized status enables them to have, quote, epistemic privilege and to be aware of events and conditions about which more privileged groups are either oblivious or dismissive. In particular, quote, within a tightly integrated capitalist system, the particular standpoint of poor indigenous and third world slash South women provides the most inclusive viewing of systemic power. And that's from Chandra Mahanti's 2002 essay. Also, contrary to the prevalent stereotype of third world women as victims, these feminisms recognize that third world women have been actively resisting oppression in various local contexts. So the reason I have this up for you right now is because as people in the U.S., as people in the West, um, we might read some of these texts and think, oh my gosh, these poor women, (laughs) Um, they have it really terrible. And yes, there's a lot of horrible things that happen to these characters, but at the same time, you know, we need to recognize the, uh, what they call here epistemic privilege of these women that they, um, are writing from, right? So the author of Persepolis, the author of Cracking India, can um, make known this oppression better than, say, someone from the U.S. can. Um, and, And sort of this last line here, right? Recognizing that third world women have been actively resisting oppression in various local contexts, right? So instead of assuming, um, you know, women in these places are helpless victims, um, recognizing their agency and seeing how they've been actively resisting. So as in Cracking India, when Lenny's mom and aunt were helping the quote unquote fallen women, were sort of uh, helping them get out of danger, um, how Margie and how her parents were sort of uh, resisting these oppressive regimes, right? So looking at it from the viewpoint of these women who are pushing against their own oppression, right? As, as instead of thinking, um, you know, these sort of hopeless, uh, people that, you know, we have to go help, right? Like that's sort of what I'm saying is that, you know, we want to recognize their own agency in, um, enacting change for themselves and others. Okay. So some connections here, Uh, Last week's discussion post, I actually asked you to look at um, Cracky India through 
um, one of one of three different lenses, right? So the first question I asked you is asking from a historicist and formalist lens. So an example of parallel scenes, that's a formal um a formal component of the novel, but it's asking you to look at parallel scenes and how they've changed from both a political and narratorial perspective, right? So it's combining those two approaches to produce something new. The second question um, asks you to look at, again, historicism and formalism. It asks you to look at the child narrator's perspective and how it changed based on these historical events, yeah? So again, we're, we're able to combine these approaches to to find sort of more interesting things about the text that we're reading. And then finally, the last one asks you to look at um, the role that gender plays in the novel and how the violence impacted men and women differently. And this is a historicist and feminist approach, right? Combining those two approaches. So finally, um, your discussion post this week. <laughs> I actually want you to sort of step back a little bit from literary critical approaches for a minute. We're gonna come back to them with other texts, but primarily I want you to think about uh, your overall impressions of the book. How did it make you feel? What did you learn? Did you like or dislike the book and why? What parts did you like and dislike? So I want you to write a 250 word discussion post on anything about Cracking India that interests you, bugs you, or otherwise makes you think or feel something. And as usual, make sure that you reply to at least two other discussion posts um, as well. So that's your discussion post for the week. So the last thing that I want to do is remind you that your first short essay is due this week as well, and that's going to be on either Persepolis or Cracking India. Make sure that you're looking at that, um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. And I also want to let you know that your midterm exam is next week. So make sure to look at the looking ahead file for more information on that. And again, please reach out with any questions you have. And I am looking forward to uh, reading all of your thoughts. Thanks, everybody, and have a great week.